Welcome to Learn at Work. We're delighted that you could join us today. Um, today's presentation is going to be very special. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Karen Jacobs. I'm the founding editor of the journal Work, a journal of prevention, assessment, and rehabilitation. We are honored to be able to host these free webinars and want to extend our thanks to our publisher, iOS Press, for this opportunity. Well, today's webinar is quite special. The title of the webinar is The Employment Concerns of Americans with Multiple Sclerosis Results from a National Survey. I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy this presentation by Dr. Rumrill of Kent State University and Dr. Bishop of the University of Kentucky. Let me first take a moment to introduce each of the speakers. Dr. Rumrill is a professor of rehabilitation counseling and the director of the Center for Disability Studies at Kent State University in Ohio. He conducts research regarding employment and community living issues facing people with disabilities, especially those with chronic illness. He is the author or co-author of more than 200 professional journal articles and 14 commercially published books. On a personal level, I am so excited to have Phil present as we um, work together on a grant called Project Career. So welcome, Phil. Our Thank you, second, Karen. Glad to be here. Oh, we're happy you're here. And our second presenter, Dr. Bishop, is Professor of Rehab Counseling and Rehab Counseling Doctoral Program Coordinator with the Department of Special Education and Rehab Counseling at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. He conducts research in employment and psychosocial aspects of chronic neurological conditions, including multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, and brain injury. He is the author of over 100 professional journal article and book chapters, and he has received the American Rehabilitation Counseling Association's Research Award six times. So welcome, Dr. Bishop, also. I'm going to turn the webinar now over to you, and anyone who is on our um, presentation today, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box. Um, the presenters will go through their presentation, which will be about 30 minutes to 40 minutes. And once they are finished, we will answer your questions. So thank you. Let me turn the presentation to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. And, uh, and, and welcome to everyone who's uh, uh, tuning in either with us either in real time or uh, asynchronously. We're delighted to be here and have the opportunity. Uh, and it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, sharing this program with uh, uh, two of my best friends and colleagues, Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Bishop, uh, with whom I've had the pleasure and privilege to uh, work with uh, very closely over the years. So uh, Karen Malachy, uh, thank you for uh, uh, making this opportunity uh, possible. And I'm uh, glad to be with you and glad to have another reason to work with uh, both of you. We appreciate that gracious, those gracious introductions as well, uh, Karen. Thank you so much for that. Maliki, I didn't know anyone was keeping track of all that stuff, but uh, I'm glad to know that uh, somebody is. We will, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we're on the title slide here, but you can flip uh, beyond that. But we're delighted to be here to talk with you about the results from a national survey of the employment concerns of Americans with multiple sclerosis. This is a project uh, Dr. Bishop and I worked on, uh, funded by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, their healthcare uh, uh, policy and delivery research uh, grants competition. We certainly appreciate the MS Society's generous support of our research uh, over the years, and we're grateful to the chapters of the National MS Society uh, and their staff members who participated in this project, as well as people with MS who took the time to complete the surveys to help us develop a picture of the employment uh, situation for Americans with, with MS. By way of overview, uh, the first uh, content slide has some just general remarks about multiple sclerosis. And um, uh, we do this with apologies to people who are familiar with uh, uh, MS and its etiology, but we thought this might just provide some good overview information uh, to kind of get out there uh, uh, by way of foundation. So we know that MS is one of the most common neurological disorders in the world. 
it's characterized by lesions that occur uh, on white matter tracts, nerve tissue, uh, in the central nervous system, that is the brain and the spinal cord. What happens with MS is that the immune system recognizes the myelin or the uh, uh, fatty tissue that, that covers and protects uh, a nerve tissue. It recognizes the myelin as a foreign body and essentially metabolizes uh, that, um, that myelin sheath. And this blocks or slows the conveyance of electrical impulses uh, from the brain to the rest of the body via the spinal cord. So the purpose of myelin is to facilitate the conduct of impulses throughout the body uh, originating in the brain and going back and forth. And with the uh, destruction to the myelin, those uh, uh, signals uh, often don't co go through the way that they should. And so the lesions occur where uh, the body's immune system then recognizes that there's been a break or disruption in the myelin and it creates scar tissue or plaques, therefore um, uh, producing uh, lesions that are uh, noticeable on magnetic resonance imaging scans. And the symptoms of MS are determined by the uh, both the size of these lesions and the location of them uh, in multiple spots along the, brain, uh, along the spinal cord and or in the brain. Because MS affects the entire central nervous system, you can see if you go to the next slide uh, that there's a wide range of functional uh, uh, areas that are affected by this disease. And the most common symptom of all is uh, physical uh, and, uh, and psychological uh, fatigue. But we also see people with MS frequently reporting balance and coordination problems, uh, diminished physical capacity, numbness and tingling, especially in the extremities, bowel and bladder dysfunction, uh, bipolar disorder, and other affective responses like anxiety disorders and depression, uh, spasticity, uh, uh, motor dysfunction, uh, really of all kinds, chronic pain, cognitive impairment experienced by uh, more than half of people with uh, MS, uh, visual impairment, sexual dysfunction, speech and language difficulties. So you can see that MS can really disrupt functioning in virtually any area of personal and social activity. That's one of the things that makes it so difficult to uh, adjust to. And as the term multiple uh, implies, uh, MS has to occur in more than one location in the brain and along the spinal cord. So that means that most people with MS are dealing with multiple uh, symptoms as part of their disease experience. Next slide, please. Uh, clinical observations of MS date back as early as the uh, 14th century. And, uh, we, uh, but but um, uh, clinical diagnostic, uh, diagnostic criteria uh, for MS have been available since the early uh, 1900s. Um, and we know that MS affects about 450,000 people in the United States alone, about 2.3 million people uh, worldwide. So this is a fairly uh, a uh, high incidence uh, uh, condition, and it's increasing in incidence uh, uh, as, as time goes on. Mostly due, we think, to the continued refinement and sophistication of electromagnetic uh, imaging, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI scans. We can diagnose MS very uh, much more quickly in the disease process than used to be possible. Uh, MS is most common uh, among women of European uh, extraction. Uh, three quarters of people worldwide uh, are women, although it can occur in uh, just about uh, uh, every racial or ethnic uh, uh, group. There are growing numbers in the United States of Latinos and African Americans who are um, experiencing MS, seeing a heightened incidence among those uh, populations as well. Very uncommon MS is among people of uh, Asian uh, lineage, lineages, but most other um, uh, 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 races uh, and ethnicities seem to be vulnerable to uh, MS, but most commonly, most often, even so far among people of Caucasian descent. The cause of MS is thought to be a, a combination of genetic, environmental, and autoimmune factors. That is, it is thought that one would inherit the uh, uh, predisposition to acquire MS or an other autoimmune disorder. Then there's an environmental trigger or stressor that occurs in some way. Um, could be a, a pregnancy or birth of a child is a pretty common uh, time 
uh, for people to uh, for women to notice that they have MS, but the immune system is taxed in some way, in other words, and then uh, essentially malfunctions and begins to metabolize the myelin. So the idea is that you're most likely to get MS if you have a genetic uh, uh, predisposition to it. If it runs in your family, it's not hereditary per se, but having a first order relative, that is brother, sister, mother, daughter, uh, uh, father, uh, son, who has MS makes someone six times more likely to get MS at some point in their lives than, um, uh, than is uh, evident in the general population. So you inherit that propensity to acquire MS, something happens to tax your immune system, we don't always know what that is, and then the immune system uh, uh, overreacts in effect and begins to destroy the myelin. But the precise cause of MS, who will get it and who will not, uh, remains uh, uh, unknown. Um, next slide, we talk, look at unique features of MS. Uh, Dr. Bishop and I study other chronic illnesses as well, and MS is unique compared to many other chronic illnesses. Uh, in its onset in early to middle adulthood. The peak incidence of initial symptoms occurs around age 30, with most diagnoses being conferred between ages 20 and 40. So we've got a young adult uh, early to middle career uh, phenomenon that uh, bears on the employment question, which we'll talk about more as we move on. The sheer range of symptoms and the unpredictability uh, with which the disease manifests itself. We say the slide, you see it says capricious disease process. So the unpredictability combined with the wide range of symptoms creates some unique challenges for people with MS and their families to cope with this intrusive uh, disease. High incidence among uh, women, uh, as we talked about before, uh, not unique to other autoimmune disorders. Some, some other uh, autoimmune disorders are more common among women, of course, but we have gender issues built into the rehabilitation process when we're talking about folks with MS, given all the responsibilities that women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s uh, have regarding family and work and things of that nature. So it's important with the majority of people with MS being women that we attend to those issues related to gender and the role and, uh, the role and interaction of, of women uh, with the workforce and family interaction and things of that nature. Presence of cognitive impairment, as we mentioned before, uh, not all uh, uh, chronic uh, diseases bring with them cognitive impairment, MS does, and that can be one of the more challenging and frustrating aspects of the disease. Relatively normal life expectancies, uh, very close to the life expectancies for people without uh, uh, MS. So we're looking at employment issues over the full uh, work uh, life cycle, if you will. Uh, and the impact on career development, which we'll talk about here um, you know, in, in, in just a moment. We go on to the next slide, some things about MS and employment. We know that 98% of people with MS have employment histories. That means they've worked at some point in the past. In this particular study we did uh, that we'll talk about in depth here in a moment, 82% of these folks were still employed at the time of diagnosis, and yet only between 25 and 40% of people with MS retain their employment, continue their careers as time and the illness progress. In fact, the uh, labor force participation rate among Americans with MS uh, today in 2016 here in the United States is right about 40 percent. So we've got this uh, experienced uh, uh, group of, of, of workers who are disengaging from the workforce uh, really in wholesale fashion. The next slide, MS and unemployment, gives you an idea of exactly uh, the, the, the nature of this, of this problem. We know, for example, that three quarters of, of unemployed people with MS leave their jobs voluntarily. We know that four fifths of these same folks, unemployed people with MS, feel they still uh, they could still work. And we know that three quarters of people of unemployed people with MS would actually like to re-enter the workforce. So we see people disengaging from the workforce, uh, usually of their own. Uh, choosing by these uh, statistics here, uh, even before the disease has rendered them incapable of working, again by their own reports, and then they end up regretting that decision by virtue of the fact that they want to go back into the workforce. So from a vocational rehabilitation perspective, what we'd like to do is try to catch people before they disengage from the workforce, but very soon into the disease process, so many people with MS leave their jobs that it creates a big problem deprives them of the opportunity to earn a living and to be uh, financially independent, and it deprives society of the valuable labor resource that exists in this group of productive, capable, and experienced workers. 
Uh, Dr. Bishop and I and, and many others have done a, a number of studies over the year looking at the factors associated with employment status uh, among people with MS. What are the risk factors for job loss among people with MS after diagnosis? We know that males are more likely to retain employment over time uh, after being diagnosed with MS than are women. We know that people with higher socioeconomic status, higher levels of education who are working in higher paid uh, jobs are more likely to be able to retain their employment as time goes on. Uh, uh, we, we've seen a, a number of studies that show kind of a straight uh, a linear relationship between uh, age and unemployment. The older someone is with MS, the more likely he or she is to be unemployed. This speaks to the disengagement from the labor force that happens at fairly young ages. Uh, people with MS disengage from the labor force at early, much earlier ages than the general population, even though their life expectancies are quite normal. So they have longer retirements than folks with without uh, uh, disabilities, and that creates some some planning and service delivery challenges as well. We know that people who experience cognitive impairment, severe physical uh, disabilities, uh, uh, in particular, and the um, uh, uh, mental health diagnoses like depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder are more likely to disengage from the workforce than people who have other symptom patterns, with cognitive impairment being the strongest predictor of unemployment. If you have a cognitive impairment as part of your disease experience, you're four to six times more likely to be unemployed than someone with MS with no cognitive impairment. So this is a big issue in terms of accommodation uh, and, and, and planning uh, the next career step where um, uh, if someone's dealing with cognitive issues, you have to attend to those very carefully because they have a significant bearing on, uh, on their employment future. Uh, the course and severity of the disease, the more severe physical and psychological uh, effects of the illness, people whose condition is more progressive in nature uh, rather than the relapsing remitting uh, kind. The relapsing remitting form of MS is more common, but often that turns into a more progressive course. And if the course of MS turns into a progressive one, and, and those folks are more likely to uh, uh, lose their jobs than people whose conditions stay uh, with the, re the cycles of relapses and remissions. Job type, people whose jobs require a great deal of physical exertion, jobs that require them to work out of doors, find a much more difficult uh, time uh, maintaining employment, owing, of course, to the, the various symptoms of MS that we mentioned before. Employer attitudes, of course, have a great bearing on one's ability to accommodate his or her limitations in the workplace, and we see this being a big factor. And of course, in the uh, extreme form, uh, the behavioral manifestation of negative attitude on the part of employers, workplace discrimination, we see uh, being uh, significantly related, the presence of workplace discrimination significantly related to job loss for folks with MS. Uh, slide, uh, next one please, on workplace discrimination, study we did a few years ago related to people's perception of their treatment in the workplace. And we find uh, this was, again, conducted about 14 or 15 years ago. And some of our findings uh, in this study corroborate these, and some uh, actually contradict them. So Dr. Bishop will share with you uh, what's new in this case. But uh, several years ago, 73% of people with MS felt they were uh, treated unfair, unfairly in the hiring process, as you can see. 58% were denied reasonable accommodations. 53% uh, felt they received lower pay than other workers. These are big problems, of course. 59% uh, re refused schedule modifications that would have helped them continue in employment. Uh, again, 73% uh, receiving inadequate information, um, excuse me, re re receiving inadequate health insurance coverage. 69% uh, uh, received little or no uh, uh, information from their uh, employers about their legal rights. And 80% uh, of people in this particular uh, study experienced some form of workplace discrimination since the onset of their MS. So we see some big uh, problems, but it had been, prior to this study that we're going to talk about right now, uh, it had been 15 years or so since there had been a comprehensive national uh, assessment of the employment concerns facing people with MS. So we wanted a contemporary view of the perspectives on employment of people with MS to look at these issues and these factors associated with employment status and kind of update ourselves on what's going on uh, with regard to uh, the employment situation. 
So we, uh, with funding from the MS Society, as I mentioned, created a survey uh, that included critical employment-related concerns facing people with MS. We gathered responses to these items along two dimensions in a yes-no format. So for example, is it important to you that people with uh, MS, and, and again, yes or no, uh, and are you satisfied that people with MS, yes or no, for example, have access to assistive technology resources needed for work? Is it important to you, yes or no, and are you satisfied, yes or no, that people with MS are evaluated no more frequently uh, than other workers? Uh, is it important to you, yes or no, are you satisfied, yes or no, that people with MS have uh, uh, opportunities for uh, uh, job training or retraining? So these are the kinds of questions, and, and by doing this, what we uh, hope to uh, identify um, was the highest priority concerns facing people with MS. So uh, both the strengths and the weaknesses. And a strength, what's working well and what isn't. So a strength would be one that has a high important and satisfaction rating. And a weakness would be that a highly important item with which people were dissatisfied. Um, so in terms of the goals, we're on the next slide, by the way. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Uh, so by identifying this profile of strengths and weaknesses, we wanted to identify strategies to preserve the strengths, to remedy the weaknesses, and create uh, an, uh, an employment agenda to improve the, the, the rate of labor force participation for people with MS by strengthening the strengths and by remedying weaknesses. Next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about the survey methodology. We developed a uh, survey which contained 38 high-priority employment concerns. These were identified from a master list of about 160 employment issues um, and with the help of a working group of 13 people with MS who helped us identify what they thought were the most important items uh, uh, facing uh, their constituency. Um, we identified geographically uh, representative uh, samples of, of nine chapters of the National MS Society representing 22 states in Washington, D.C. And we developed a random sub, uh, a, a total random sample of 8,000 people uh, from nine, from these nine chapters. Uh, eight chapters uh, created random samples of 800 of their members, and another chapter, a ninth chapter, identified 1,600 of their members. Uh, that particular chapter had a high representation of Hispanic Latinos and uh, Hispanics and Latinos and also African Americans. And so we sought to oversample uh, within this uh, uh, study so that we could ensure that at least 5% of our sample were Latino and 5% were African Americans. We do this uh, because there's a growing incidence of, uh, uh, of MS among those uh, populations. And 5% is the figure that we keep seeing about the percentage of people, Americans with MS. About 5% are Latino, about 5% African Americans. So we created an oversampling procedure. And you'll see from the results in a minute that uh, we were actually able to get uh, 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 a fairly uh, substantial samples from each of those groups. Um, from the, uh, we, so we sent out the uh, 8,000 surveys. 631 of those surveys came back as undeliverable, so we have a total target uh, sample in the available pool of 7,369 people. Collected the returns over a several week uh, period back in 2014. We received 1,924 respondents. Next slide, please, uh, Maliki. Uh, it's a 26% uh, response rate for those of you who are keeping track you'll see that our sample looked an awful lot like people with MS in general uh, nationwide. 79% of the sample was a, a female, 76% were Caucasian. You can see that 11% were Hispanic or Latino, 11% uh, were African American, so our oversampling procedure uh, paid off. 2% uh, uh, reported other uh, races or ethnicities, but mostly we're talking about Caucasians, African Americans, and Latinos. Average age of 54 years, a um, little older than the, uh, uh, than the total population of people with MS. People who participate in the National MS Society tend to be slightly older than the general population, so 
So we have that uh, phenomenon there. But people who could reflect on their career uh, development, um, as I mentioned before, 98% of these folks had worked in the past and 82% were working at the time of diagnosis. Yet, only 40% of this group of seasoned and experienced workers were employed full or part-time at the time of the survey. This is especially disappointing when you look at the fact that 98% of the sample were high school graduates and 46% of these experienced workers held four-year college degree. You see a mix of uh, urban and suburban settings. 85% of the sample lived, uh, described their communities as urban or suburban, and 15% described their communities as uh, rural. Uh, symptoms reported by uh, respondents in this survey, um, you just see percentages here ranging, as thing, you know, it looks a lot like the second slide of the, of the presentation, Set almost 80%, 79% of uh, folks in this sample reporting fatigue, balance and coordination uh, 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 problems, the 64.6% .6 in descending order of frequency from there, you see diminished physical uh, capacity, the gait and mobility problems, uh, uh, tingling in the extremities, bowel and bladder dysfunction, uh, numbness, and it kind of goes on uh, from there. 49.2% had re uh, reported cognitive impairment, spasticity, uh, pain, especially in the bladder, sleep disturbances, depression, uh, vision problems, anxiety, sexual dysfunction, speech problems, uh, tremors, bipolar disorder, uh, and the list goes on. Now these numbers, these percentages add up to more than 100% because as the term multiple implies these folks were dealing with multiple uh, uh, symptoms of the uh, illness. The average number of symptoms reported by a respondent as part of their disease experience was I think, I don't have that here in front of me, but I'm, uh, I do have it, it's 5.8. 5.8 symptoms on average. So you're seeing that people are dealing with a lot of symptoms at the same time. So this group of experienced, well-educated, well-trained workers who had a uh, great perspective on employment, uh, but who were in the majority unemployed, uh, gave us a lot of terrific information about uh, the employment concerns that are affecting them. And so when we go to the results, the employment strength is the first section. And again, here I mentioned that the strengths are ones with, with uh, high importance ratings and high satisfaction ratings. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Bishop to talk about the 32 strengths that had importance ratings and satisfaction ratings of greater than 50 percent. Thank you and thank you Dr. Jacobs for the opportunity to participate. Happy to present the results. So as uh, Dr. Remmer was saying, the 32 items uh, identified with high importance and high satisfaction are listed here. Uh, I'm going to go through these. Uh, as I do, I want you to think about um, the fact that uh, these uh, clustered into into a, a number of themes. So uh, as I read through these, think about the themes that you can see in the data. So the um, in terms of highest importance and uh, satisfaction, uh, items that were indicated included people with MS are encouraged to take control of their lives. People with MS have the same maternity and family leave options as other workers. People with MS are provided the same retirement benefits as other workers, are made aware of employer expectations in the same way as other employees, receive the same severance pay as other workers, receive the same on-the-job training opportunities as other workers, have, senior, have their seniority honored in the same way as other employers, employees uh, are given references from past employers based on work performance, not on disability status, have physical access to workplace facilities, evaluated no more frequently than other workers, and continuing with the employment strengths, uh, people with MS have access to service providers who understand the needs of people with MS. So that was 95%. 95.6% said that was important. 64% were satisfied with that. Uh, are not subjected to harassment or intimidation in the workplace because of their MS. 63% were satisfied. Uh, can expect employers to respect their privacy regarding health and disability related information. 
are expected by their physicians and significant others to remain employed after diagnosis. And you can see about two-thirds, a big drop there in terms of importance, and 61% satisfied. Our asked interview questions related to job tasks and personal qualifications rather than to health and disability matters. Have their qualifications for employment and advancement fairly evaluated by employers? Have access to adequate information about social security programs? So you notice we're getting down in the satisfaction into the 50s now, 50%. Have opportunities for job opportunity for job training or retraining. Have access to health insurance when changing jobs or returning to a previous job. Have adequate health insurance coverage. You can see that's a very high importance rating on that one, 97.2%. Uh, and then are treated fairly by employers in the hiring process. And continuing with strengths, about 97% said this was important. They have adequate information about benefits such as health and disability, short and long term insurance. Uh, are treated fairly in terms of, uh, sorry, in termination or demotion decisions made by their employers are evaluated based on their performance, not on assumptions about MS. High importance, fairly uh, low satisfaction on that one. Have access to assistive technology resources needed for work. Are recalled from layoffs in the same manner as other workers. Have the same opportunity for promotion as other workers. Make the decision to quit or retire without being pressured or forced to do so by their employers. People with MS know their rights regarding job-related physical examinations. Can expect employers to respond to their accommodation needs in a timely manner. Have access to the full range of employment opportunities offered by their employee, employers. And they currently uh, know what to do if they encounter discrimination at work. So we have this uh, experienced and well-educated group of workers uh, who are employed at only a rate of 40%, right? And yet out of 38 items, they are uh, 38 high important, highly important items because the lowest importance rating in the whole study was 67.7%, yet they're, uh, for the most part, satisfied with the current employment situation. This is a little counterintuitive in some way. It's a lot different than the study we did about 15 years ago, but maybe there are some insights in these employment weaknesses uh, where they're only six, but it may be uh, compelling. These are the items of importance rating of greater than 50%, but dissatisfaction rate of greater than 50 Sorry for interrupting, Malachi, but this just strikes me as odd. Yes. Yeah. So to continue with the six employment weaknesses, um, people with, S, with MS understand the health insurance provisions and protections of the Affordable Care Act, know how to discuss their accommodation needs with employers, can request a review of their accommodation needs without fear of retaliation, Understand the employment protections of Title I in the Americans with Disabilities Act as amended, ADAAA, 51.7%, uh, uh, are considered for other jobs in the same company if their MS prevents them from returning to their former jobs. And then the last one, understanding the benefits of disclosing disability status to employers. So the benefits of disclosure. So in terms of uh, summarizing the, uh, the most prominent employment concerns reported by people with MS, and as I said, um, these, these clustered into, into themes which we had identified. All 38 items were evaluated as important by at least two-thirds, 67 percent. Uh, the top 10 strengths clustered into the following themes. Uh, equitable employee benefits equitable treatment, 
from the employer, accessibility, employer and coworker attitudes, training and advancement opportunities. And then the six weaknesses clustered into the following themes, uh, disclosure, job accommodations, legal provisions and protections, and issues related to changing jobs. So we, we basically wanted to conclude by discussing the uh, implications for vocational rehabilitation practice. So what does this mean for um, professionals uh, working in vocational rehabilitation? And as we go through these, to me, it seems that we're talking about um, basically two, two different uh, categories. We're talking about um, job retention and reemployment for that um, high number of people who uh, want to or feel like they would like to return to work uh, after leaving work with, with MS. Um, so in terms of the uh, implications, we identified, first of all, we need to, uh, as rehab professionals, increase access to appropriate educational and training opportunities. So you think about um, ways that we can do that, and we think about the educational and training opportunities that we're talking about. The consideration there, I think, is, is um, when we're talking about working with an individual, and when we're talking about working um, uh, in terms of advocacy and, and, and larger populations, people with MS. I think the important thing to remember in terms of education and training opportunities is that when we're working with an individual, we've seen that um, the reasons people struggle with employment with MS uh, are varied and often generally uh, overlap. So those symptoms that Phil talked about, the uh, uh, issues about uh, equitable work uh, situation, and certainly understanding benefits, understanding um, rights under the ADAA, and um, uh, being able to uh, uh, talk about disclosure in an effective way, and then thinking about health insurance benefits. All those sorts of things are areas where um, it is uh, important that we're making sure that people understand uh, uh, their rights, their opportunities, and, and so providing uh, education, assessment, and training at, at both the individual and the um, broader ad advocacy level. Definitely, just, and I think I, I, I just want to I just want to underscore that, Malachi. I think that's a really uh, very important. I think also um, it's important to keep in mind most people with MS view dealing with MS as a really lousy thing to have to do. Psychosocially, this is a very difficult illness to adjust to and deal with. So we got to look at uh, providing personal adjustment counseling to help people increase their coping skills and stress management skills. These are very important aspects of the uh, 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 disease experience. And people are going to continue their careers. They've got to attend to their mental health. Focusing on their own medical compliance, uh, uh, treatment regimes, things of that nature, uh, and following physicians in life to make sure that their that their health is is maintained as much as possible, becoming their own best experts and managing their symptoms. Another very important part of the vocational rehabilitation process because if your health isn't uh, isn't as good as uh, as uh, your health needs to be as good as it possibly can be, so you can be working at optimal uh, potential. I guess we're on the next slide, Malachi. You mentioned. Uh, uh, increasing, you know, as part of the advocacy, increasing people's uh, uh, knowledge and awareness of, uh, of, of legal provisions of um, the Affordable Care Act, the ADAAA, and other uh, legislation. Thinking of the health, the uh, Affordable Care Act being one of the sources of dissatisfaction for this particular sample, not understanding their health insurance coverage for sure. Right. Uh, the other ones of the were identified included providing consultation to consumers and employers regarding workplace accommodations, uh, helping consumers develop skills related to disclosure of disability, and providing uh, transferable skills analysis and career redirection services for consumers unable to return to their previous jobs. Yeah, there's a lot there. A lot more we'd uh, uh, we we we. Um 
uh, we could say about these signs. I think this would be a good place to uh, pause and Karen take any questions that anybody uh, might have and uh, uh, we'll conclude this as the uh, organized part of our discussion but we'll hang on the line for uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Um, Phil and Alpany, um, that was such an interesting presentation. Now anybody who is on, please feel free to type in uh, the chat box your questions. I don't see any right now, but let me pose um, a question. You, you talked about implications uh, for the future. What do you see either together or individually you considering doing in the future? And also, one of the questions that we always have regarding any kind of research is, um, what do you see um, as funding sources, um, perhaps for people who are on this webinar who might want to conduct research? So I gave you two questions there, and whatever you can answer would be great. Um, we do have a question uh, that says, "May could you explain again what you meant by strength cluster and weakness cluster. So maybe you could address that question first, and then back to mine. Certainly, um, what we were what we were talking about there. The strengths are the items with importance and satisfaction ratings both over fifty percent. The weakness items were those with an importance rating of greater than fifty percent and a dissatisfaction rating of greater than fifty percent. So we just inverted the satisfaction rating, and if it was under fifty percent, we called that a dissatisfaction rating. When we talk about the strengths and weaknesses clustering into those themes, this is that was not a um, a statistical term. What we did is we just looked at the 32 strengths and put them into themes based on commonalities uh, among the items. So that was done rationally. Uh, we looked at items that seemed to kind of uh, hang together. We did have a colleague who did a, a factor analysis. Um, looking at how responses to each item uh, hung together with regard to the other items and which ones, which uh, responses to which items related to which other ones. And he found three distinct factors in the 38 uh, items, but that's not what the question is, is referring to. This is just the way we, we identified these themes because it's much, uh, it, it's, it's unwieldy to talk about 32 employment issues individually. We use the clustering into themes approach really to organize our discussion. Great question. Thank you, Phil. And and our attendees said thank you too. Um, shall we go back to um, one of the questions that I asked regarding what do either of you see yourself doing in the future um, related to working with this important population? And then, you know, what do you guide people regarding um, Oh, funding. We do have another uh, question. Let me just put that in. I think it's more of a comment. Thank you. Great to hear about your research. I'm UK based, but wondering about the issues related to disclosure that came up during your research. Um, how about answering that one first? Would you like me to repeat the question or are you all set? No, that's okay. That's a, that's a, I appreciate the, the, the uh, listener. Uh, noting that particular thing. This comes up in every study we do of people with MS, the issue of disclosure. And some of the issues, and we did some follow-up studies here uh, after these uh, studies were done, focus groups where we uh, did in a, in, a, in a more of a qualitative way, asking people for their perspectives on these issues, and they're always dissatisfied with the issue of disclosure. Part of it is a, an artifact of federal civil rights law in our Americans with Disabilities Act, Amendments Act. In order to be considered or a reasonable accommodation, your employer has to know that you're a person with a disability. And in order to request an accommodation, uh, or by virtue of requesting an accommodation, you are legally conceding that you can't perform that function in question without the accommodation. So there are a couple of risks there. One is you have to give away some of your privacy in order to obtain a workplace accommodation, that is a modification to the job or to the way it is performed that enables you to perform uh, your, your duties um, to overcome disability related work limitations. So you have to disclose that you're a person with a disability before becoming eligible for an accommodation and by saying that you need an accommodation, you're essentially saying without the accommodation you can't do some aspect of your job. People with MS understand this and they're often hesitant to make that initial they don't want to identify themselves to employers, and they don't want to concede that they're not able 
to do their job just in case the employer deems the accommodation is not feasible and then can conclude that the person is no longer capable of working and can terminate their employment. That scenario doesn't happen all that often, although it does happen sometimes, but people with MS are quite fearful of that. The other thing is they just simply feel they're not aware of the procedures for requesting for, for disclosing their disability and requesting accommodations in a way that protects that best protects their legal rights. So it's kind of a, a lack of awareness of the provisions of both the Americans with Disabilities Act, Amendments Act, and other legislation that would require a disclosure of disability. So those are some of the issues, uh, some of the issues there that people deal with in terms of disclosure. In terms of future applications, I'll defer to my colleague. Uh, he's much busier than I am. So Maliki, what have you got cooking next? Thank you. Uh, something I'm very interested in right now um, is in the in the category of job retention is. Um, trying to figure out if we can um, uh, start to tailor information specifically to people with specific characteristics. So what we've been thinking about is um, uh, we, we've identified that the uh, barriers to employment for people with MS are, are broad and diverse and include physical and cognitive functional issues, um, benefits and um, civil rights issues and then work site issues and, uh, and other research we identified, um, home accessibility issues, social issues, they're very broad. But what, what we are um, thinking about is whether we can develop some sort of assessment where we can identify for people with these characteristics or people with these issues, um, uh, what is the information that is going to be most helpful for them. And so we're working on developing uh, a matrix and also uh, looking at the, um, uh, the stages of change sort of model where you look at um, uh, whether people are starting to think about leaving work, um, made a decision and they're gathering information, that sort of process and where are they in that. And then essentially coming up with an approach where we can give them the information that they need at the time that they need it. So that's something I'm very... Um, excited about developing and uh, I think would be uh, very interesting. And in terms of the second question, um, uh, funding, uh, I'll let Phil address that more other than just to say um, uh, the uh, MS Society uh, has been um, a, a great partner in um, the employment research that we've been doing and other uh, research related to uh, psychosocial issues in MS. Um, so I highly recommend uh, the MS Society uh, as, a, as a resource. What do you think, Phil? I, I agree. A very user-friendly uh, very oh, user -friendly, uh, resource. So um, we have a couple more questions, and I want to get to them. Thank you both for those responses and um, for the suggestion also of the MS Society for funding. So um, let me give you a couple more questions that we have, and I want to thank our attendees for these questions. Um, one attendee said, uh, do people with full-time and part-time respond um, the importance of satisfaction differently? Um, I think they, they mean, is there a difference between people who are working full-time and part-time and how they respond to saying um, they're satisfied uh, with working and I guess... That's a great question. We haven't looked at that yet. We do, we can, we do have the we certainly have the ability to, to look at that within the data set because we can separate employed people into those two groups. We have looked at um, uh, the unique uh, employment concerns of women uh, in the sample of African Americans, of Latinos. Uh, so we are a, and, and uh, so we are able to uh, uh, pull, pull out um, subgroups within the sample and that'd be a very interesting comparison would be to compare the profiles of strengths and weaknesses um, but based on whether people are employed full or part-time, or perhaps three groups, employed full-time, employed part-time, and unemployed, would be very interesting. That's a great suggestion. Phil, so that, that is, um, and that's from our, um, our, our colleague uh, who has joined us today. And our colleague in the UK um, asked another question, and she said she has similar issues like you described earlier uh, from her first question. She said, um, 
did anything about the size of the employing company, the employer, have an impact or was this not identified in the research? So the size of the employer. This was, uh, this was not identified in this particular study. Uh, that would be a gr another great uh, addition. Uh, we do know that larger employers um, in the U.S. tend to have uh, more well-developed personnel policies. They tend to do more proactive compliance with uh, federal employment laws, things of that nature. Uh, they're under obligation quite often to inform their workers about their rights. And so you would think that employers in larger companies would be less likely to file uh, to be the subjects of discrimination complaints, but in fact, they're actually more likely. And it's not necessarily that they're discriminating against people uh, more frequently, you know, per capita. We think it's partly because their employers, their employees are more aware of their rights. If you're working for a larger company, you're more aware of your rights and recourses because the employer has to tell you what they are and they have more formal policies, therefore creating more room for violations. So the uh, 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 word on the street is that larger employers are often, you know, the best and most accommodating employers of, of workers with disabilities. And yet at the same time, uh, they're subject to more um, allegations of, of, of discrimination. So a little contradiction in terms of what you'd think of it kind of uh, intuitively, but we, we think that's partly why. But there certainly are differences uh, in response to disability based on the size of employer. Uh, we didn't have that as part of this study, but that'd be another interesting thing to look at. It sure would. We like the way you're all thinking. Oh, well, we've got another great question, too. Um, this one is, would job types, and it does um, relate to what, what you had um, responded to a little bit earlier, would job types and work agency size affect people with MS job adjustment flexibility and job retention? Yes, it certainly could, and we have learned in other studies that people who um, whose people who are in higher level uh, uh, higher uh, let's just say uh, higher paying occupations and occupations that require higher levels of education uh, often they tend to uh, retain employment uh, longer than people with MS who are in different kinds of jobs uh, other other kinds of jobs. Part of the reason for this is we believe that uh, those higher level jobs often don't require physical exertion, so you're not um, aggravating the uh, fatigue that accompanies MS to quite the same extent. The other thing is that higher level workers often have um, more autonomy to arrange accommodations. They feel more comfortable advocating for themselves with their employers, and so they may be they may have more power, if that makes sense, to to um, uh, implement things that would help them in the workplace. Whereas people um, in, in lower level uh, occupations, I mean lower level in terms of pay and status, that's all, um, may not have the um, standing to, uh, to have that kind of influence on the accommodations that they need. So job type does come up in a number of studies as a differential indicator of, of uh, uh, work adjustment, no doubt. This is good stuff. Thank you. So we just have a few minutes and I want to conclude the, the workshop, um, the webinar. And I want to thank um, Dr. Rumrell and Dr. Bishop for uh, a really stimulating webinar that I hope you'll share um, with your colleagues so that others can listen to it um, during um, other times rather than live today. Um, but Dr. Uh, Bishop and Dr. Um, Rumrell, any last thoughts before um, we conclude? And then I'll let people know about the next webinar. Dr. Bishop, me, you first. Yeah, let me just briefly say uh, thank you again. And um, I, I think the discussion in this particular article uh, about the issues is uh, really uh, quite good. And so I highly recommend that people do uh, look this one up in, in the journal of work. Uh, it's an excellent discussion. Thank you again. Thank you. I'll echo Dr. Bishop's uh, thanks. And Karen, always great to work with you. And Maliki, thanks so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Jacobs for this opportunity. This was a, a really a, a great time. Be happy to continue this dialogue with anybody who's uh, uh, who's interested in in uh, uh, possibly even collaborating on uh, our uh, next projects. One thing we uh, find all the time is the more we learn about MS and employment, the, the the more we know we have to learn. And so it's always that thing. The next study really provokes 
uh, questions that lead to the next one and the next one. And so following that uh, that curiosity, but it's always great to have uh, uh, fresh and new ideas um, uh, like the questions that your listeners have posed already. So Dr. Jakes, we'd be, we'd be happy to hear about any others that come in later. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you so much. Um, can we advance the slide um, so that we have our last slide up, please? And then, um, again, you are listening to Learn at Work. Uh, this is a free webinar series provided by the journal Work and its publisher, iOS Press. Can we have the next slide, please? And I just want to let you know that we have upcoming webinars. And what we're doing with our Learn at Work webinars is that we're inviting authors who have published in the journal to provide um, a free, again, webinar to discuss their article. We make each of those articles open access or what we call free to view. So if you are interested in learning more or reading the article that you just um, listened to in this webinar, please do a search and you'll find it. And again, it's open um, access. So our next webinar is October 17th. Um, Dr. Kieser um, and Rawan will be discussing the Work It study for people with arthritis. Uh, it's a study protocol and baseline sample characteristics. I think you'll find that very interesting. Um, they're both affiliated with Boston University and I've had the opportunity to hear a similar presentation. Again, their um, article will be open access, so you'll be able to read it. And then on December 8th, same time, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Dr. Tom Albin will discuss computer ergonomics state of the art. And Tom was the guest editor of a special issue of work related to um, computer ergonomics. And I think you'll find that interesting as well. We are putting together our webinar series for 2017. Um, if you follow us on Facebook or Twitter, um, or even sign up for and subscribe to our Learn at Work YouTube channel, you'll be able to learn more. Um, this webinar, which I know you all enjoyed, will be on our Learn at Work YouTube channel. So if you sign up, you'll be able to listen to it again. And just as importantly, we hope that you will share it with your friends and colleagues. So one last time, thank you to our speakers. It was a privilege to have you present at Learn at Work. Everyone who's attended, thank you for joining us again. The webinar has now concluded.